everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Penny Wright, and uh, we are delighted to have you all here to have a visit with an author who, whose book we very much admired a couple of months ago, a few months ago. I just want to mention that we have lots going on here at the library, and some of our little flyers are over on the refreshment table, so help yourselves. If you don't have a newsletter, take a newsletter. If you live outside of our library district and would like to be <coughs> on our newsletter mailing list, just join the friends at the library for whatever amount you want to donate, <coughs> Excuse me, and you will receive our newsletter every three months when it comes out. Um, <coughs> four or five months ago, when reading the New York Times book review, I came across a review, a really glowing review, of a book that looked very interesting called Stowaway. And I was lucky enough to be able to, uh, to contact its author, Lori Gwen Shapiro, and she agreed to come out. So we're very delighted that she is here with us today. And I'll tell you a couple of things about her. Oh, by the way, I want to thank Southampton Books, Hannah. Hannah is representing Southampton Books, and she came today with some books. And um, they're $24, which is a 15% discount. And it's a, this would make a great gift. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really great book. So I hope you'll read it. If you don't want to buy it, you can check it out of our library. Anyway, Lori Gwen Shapiro is a native of New York City's Lower East Side. Um, and attended Stuyvesant High School, and then Syracuse University, where she was a TV major, and she became an assistant to Peter Jennings. Maybe she'll talk about that a little bit, because she said he was a great person to work with, and he was very protective of the people working under him. Uh, she's written five books. Uh, this is the first nonfiction book she's written, and she's a filmmaker. Um, she writes articles, and the recent publication, uh, recent articles have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Magazine, The Daily Beast, Slate, uh, Aeon, Los Angeles Review of Books. And she has her own history column focusing on unsung heroes for the forward. I, I assume that's a website, is it? It's the oldest. Uh, Jewish paper, I believe yes. it sounds Okay, but forward. That sounds yeah. like it would be fun to check out. Um, she's done a lot of work as a filmmaker. I'm just going to mention a few uh, things in that regard. She's been involved in various capacities in the following films. The McCourts of Limerick, producer, co-producer. The McCourts of New York, co-producer. Finishing Heaven it was an HB film, HBO film, producer. Uh, <clears throat> the Manor, which is in production, she's an executive producer. Low Line, which is in production. I don't know if that's referring to High Line. Or <laughs> yeah. she'll, you can ask her, she will tell you. But her 2001 documentary film titled Keep the River on Your Right, a modern cannibal tale which she co-produced and co-directed with her brother David, received numerous awards, including Best Documentary Feature at the Hamptons International Film Festival in 2000, a Special Jury Award, International Documentary Film Festival in Amsterdam, an Audience Award, Special Critics Award, Los Angeles Independent Film Festival, Truer Than Fiction Award, IFP Independent Spirit Awards, the Best Documentary at the Newport Beach Film Festival, and she was also nominated for an Emmy in 2010 for producing HBO's Finishing Heaven. Stowaway, as I mentioned, garnered high praise uh, in, from the New York Times, and uh, we're honored that she's here today to talk about it. Please welcome Lori Gwen Shapiro. Thank you. 
I'm going to use the mic, don't worry. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to be here. I haven't actually been back to the Hamptons since the uh, Hamptons Film Festival in 2000, but that was quite an experience as we won the Golden Starfish Award. But I also, I, I, one of my uh, college friends' uh, mothers is here too. So Mrs. Bayer, it's very exciting. Where are you? I can't see. Over here, I haven't seen her since uh, the 1980s. <laughs> I will tell you a little bit about this book. This is my, as um, Penny said, and, and thank you, Penny, for inviting me. This is a real treat. Um, I just took the jitney out here from New York City. So, um, The Stowaway was a book that is a nonfiction book. A lot of people think it sounds like a novel, and that was exactly the kind of book that I wanted to write. I had written, a, when I was very young, I had a, a quirky book that was, um, actually reviewed, of all people, by Anthony Bourdain in the New York Times before he got famous. And that was my first, and then I thought that's the way the, the publishing world works. So I got a film deal, and then the film nothing happened, and then I got sucked into something called Chicklet. I don't know if everybody remembers Bridget Jones' Diary. And that was where young women were sort of pushed, even though I, and at this, concurrently, I was doing this uh, film world where I was doing big, amazing, truer-than-life, true stories, documentaries. And as I've gotten older, I wanted to go back to writing and bring some of the both experiences together. So what I was wanting to do in, in about 2013 is when I started uh, working on this book, I was looking desperately for a story that would read like a novel. I don't know if anyone knows um, David Grant, Killers of the Flower Moon, or <laughs> Lost City of Z, or Susan Orlean, the kind of stuff you read in The New Yorker. And I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to find a story that would unfold like a novel, using that experience that I had, but using the research techniques that I had learned as a documentary maker. And the problem is, where do you find such a story? <laughs> so I decided I was going to start focusing on just write experience. I'm going to write some nonfiction articles. And my beat uh, was the Lower East Side, where I grew up. I, I have bought my childhood apartment, and my widowed, widower dad has moved back in with my husband and my teen daughter. Um, so we've never left <laughs> more than 100 years. Um, but the thing that happened was that I didn't know where to begin, and so I decided I would start by covering um, a local, I'm, I'm secular Jewish, but there was a, a local church, a Catholic church in the Lower East Side that had been the first uh, Catholic church established. Um, because there was a lot of prejudice towards Polish community, the first Polish Catholic church in New York City. And I thought I would do a little 200 word article. The New York Times had um, a blog for the lower, downtown, and I thought, well, at least I'll get the Times credit. It's not going to be real in the paper, but I can say I wrote something for the Times. Took it for $200. And again, one other bit of advice that I had gotten, my high school English teacher was Frank McCourt. And wow. he was my mentor, and I always have his head, his, his words in my head, which is, write what you know, write local. You know the stories of your own neighborhood better than anyone else. So I went to this church, and I was going to write about the history of it, a short little piece, and I started to do my little research, and I found on the New York Times online one mention that said uh, from 19... Uh, in, right before the Depression, that 500 kids are marching from Tompkins Square, which is now in the East Village, it was all the Lower East Side then, to City Hall to, to cheer on the, the, the stowaway kid, the Polish stowaway kid, who had gone to this church. And I just stopped in my tracks. Because I thought, that sounds like a pretty amazing story. Wait, this was... Uh, Admiral Richard Byrd, I don't know how many people here know who Richard Byrd was, not everyone does now, but back then he was one of the most well-known men in the world, uh, along with Charles Lindbergh. And this was the first American expedition to Antarctica, and there was a stowaway on it? And I just thought, this is crazy. But how am I, I tried to find a little bit more research um, online, you do what you can, there was very little mentioned. Um, I went to the New York Public Library, and got some of the old papers that are not online, I found a tiny mention. So I was like, wow, this is not going to be a book after all. 
then I remembered, what would I do as a documentary maker? And this is where this experience came together for me. What we do as filmmakers is we try to find descendants or anyone who was there. So I thought, I will try to find someone that is there. Um, was there, and I, I had a, he had an unusual name. His name was William Goronsky. He was only 17 years old. Um, he would probably be, now he'd be 116, so, <laughs> but he certainly wasn't going to be alive when I was searching for him. And I started to make a chart. I don't know if anyone has Excel, but I had the craziest Excel chart with all the Goronskys up and down the East Coast. And I just had a huge cup of coffee, like a, a good New Yorker, and I just started, okay, let's start. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you how these calls went. I would call up and say, hi, um, I'm a writer, and I'm trying to find a descendant of a stowaway who jumped into the Hudson River, this is how we got to the boat, <laughs> and swam across the river to Hoboken and went to Antarctica with Commander Bird, Richard Bird, in 1928. Are you a descendant? <laughs> and I, just, I started to get an incredible amount of hang-ups, you know, like, who is this crazy person? <laughs> and I can tell you exactly when I hit pay dirt. It was number 16. Her, there was a woman who was up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Has anyone ever been up there? It's really beautiful. It's where Hopper did his paint. It's, it's, it's right outside of uh, Portland, and there's all sorts of lighthouses. And I thought, well, wait a second. If this man had a, a, a life at sea, maybe he would be near the ocean. That made sense to me. So I, I, I called, and I heard um, a voice with a very heavy Polish accent answer the phone. Her name was Gisela Goronski. And... I just thought this can't be a descendant because he was born in New York City in the Lower East Side in around 1910 uh, and his descendants would just have American accents. But I went through my spiel and she said at the very end of the call, that was my husband. Oh, oh Jesus. Jesus. That was, no. And it was just my Titanic moment. <laughs> I'm going to share that with you because it's my favorite moment. I just, my jaw dropped open. And I started talking to her, and I said, would you have any memories, or you know, could I possibly talk to you? And she just said, I have everything. Come to me. Come and make your way to Cape Elizabeth. And I got, I, I don't drive, I'm a classic New Yorker, <laughs> but the equivalent of the jitney to, <laughs> to, to Portland, I took. And um, I met with her, and she had, this is what, how I was able to get this book deal. She had a scrapbook that her parent, his parents had kept in 1928, and he had been a naughty kid. I mean, he tried not only to stow away once, but he was caught, and there was uh, it was on it was on the the way they found out about this, his cup, his face was on the cover of the New York Times. <laughs> he was missing. Then there was a few more stowaway attempts. I don't want to give away the whole book, but um, but eventually. They couldn't believe what was going on. And I will tell you that he, she also told me a little bit more that he had hitchhiked his way after being caught down to um, Hampton Rolls in Virginia, where the, there, were two, there were four boats leaving. There were the two main ships. The flagship was called the City of New York, and it was leaving from the Hudson River. The um, supply ship was called the Eleanor Bowling, which was Bird's mother's name. Um, and that was leaving from the Gowanus Canal, which is uh, near the Atlantic Ocean. And there were two whaling ships, that one was carrying 100 dogs and two airplanes. But, so this was an incredible moment in American history. Um, because if you think about Antarctica exploration, I bet most people, if you want to get them excited about Antarctica, you say Shackleton. <laughs> and everybody, like, got, everybody loves the Shackleton story, but this is Bird. He was going, the, the Shackleton, Robert Scott, um, all of that era of uh, um, Antarctica was about 10 years prior, 1911, is when um, we had the first, a man walked to the South Pole. But this was different. What he was doing was taking some of the old school, which were the, the dogs that you needed to survive, as well as airplanes. And he was going to fly over Antarctica for the first time and, and drop a flag over the South Pole. And you can imagine what the excitement, because think about if you're flying over the United States for the first time and you're first to see the Grand Canyon. There would, nobody knew what was going on. This was the era of people 
discovering discovering in a, in a um, you know European perspective of Komodo dragons. I mean, nobody people there were Scientific American ran an article that there might be dinosaurs there, lost peoples. That's how exciting it was. Bird was a master of promotion. He had flown over, and not as a navigator, not as the pilot, the North Pole. The first to go over the North Pole, 1926. Uh, and Billy, this was his idol. This was his rock star, Billy Goronsky. And he got out of high school and was able to go to the parade. But as soon as Bird got back, people over at the Explorers Club started to doubt that he'd actually gone right over the pole. And the road. So, but he didn't take any um, photographs. There was no proof. Then he wanted to get his name. You know, he was again. He was um, just a really candy with publicity. So he decided to sign up for the Ortier uh, Prize. Now you might not know that particular name, but you definitely know who won that game, that race. And Bird was the favorite, and his plane broke down. And a young man named Charles Lindbergh raced over the, there. And he, Bird was very, um, you know, he was very respectful. Of course, Lindbergh had the biggest ticker tape parade of all time, but Bird had a second parade for losing. Everyone loved parades back then. <laughs> the mayor was uh, Jimmy Walker, and he had um, a, a man in charge of parades named Grover, uh, I think it was Wheeler, I have to check, but he was the man who would just greet everybody. You know, America, New York especially, was rolling in the dough. It was a jolly old time. And now, he was going to make his name. And then we're going back to Bird. So this is really, you're going back and forth between a stowaway, and this is a way into this crazy uh, expedition that America has forgotten, but was really what everybody was interested in back in 1928. Um, he didn't know what to do about his legacy, and he met with um, Sigmund Freud's nephew, who was uh, the first, uh, the father of public relations. And he said, what about if you fly over the South Pole? You know, people walk there, but no one has flying over there. That will be exciting. And it was really a scientific expedition with some of the most well-known scientists. But the flag thing was, you know, canny for publicity. And they decided to open it up. They didn't have any enough money. This was not paid for by the government. This was all donations from brands, like Ebrandy now, paying for this expedition. And he basically said, we'll, we'll have some volunteers. And 70,000 people applied for 65 spots. So Billy, as a high school kid, he, he graduated at, at, um, at 18 in my mother's high school, textile high school, which was a, like the art and design of back then. He was an arty kid. Um, he didn't have a chance. His father, did, who was Polish, uh, Rudy, did not even want to hear him talk about this Michigas. You know, he said, I, in his, and he was like, who is this bird? And he had his own uh, uh, heroes from Poland. Um, so basically, Billy decided the only way, and he was not under 18, and, and even to apply, not that he would apply, he would have had to have his parental signature. And he decided the only way that he had a shot was to stow away. So this is giving you a little bit of the background, because it's hard to, I could start reading them, but maybe I'll read a tiny bit later, but... This is, this is what he's up against. What's crazy about this story is that um, you think that he might be the only stowaway. And I'm going to actually read a tiny passage, which will show you a little. This is a, a, not the beginning of the book, but this is sort of after he's crossed the Hudson River. Um, and you'll see why this is very funny. Not very long, by the way. Um, after he took his first strokes through the murky, reeky, Reeking Hudson River, Billy feared the whipping winds. He kept count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, feeling a growing ease in the choppy water, even if it wasn't going as fast as he thought. Keep going, he told himself. It was less than a mile to the ship. So long ago, on outdoor swims with the Polish Falcons, which was a group of um, that trained to keep, if Poland was to become a nation again, they were going to keep their men fit. He had mastered the right way to breathe. Later, a streetwise immigrant's kid, he jumped off the East River Pier at a roped-off swimming area called Central Lanes, where even as a nine-year-old, he faced a harsher current than here. Billy was a veteran of hundreds of river swims. 
As he told it later, the only thing on his mind was his one shot to get before Commander Byrd and appeal to his mercy. And I will say he was not an admiral yet. This is the, the expedition that the government made him an admiral for. Byrd liked stowaways. All the 17-year-old could do was aim for the flagship and hope for the best. As he approached the, the city of New York, there was enough light to spot, spot a hauser, a thick towboat, hanging down to the brackish water. Despite numb fatigue, he found the strength to pull himself up and then kept his footing on the slippery deck. Covered in river scum, hair hanging down his forehead like oily kelp, he found his way to the hold. He re removed his squelchy, wet graduation suit, rolled the jacket of pants out of view, and stripped to his underwear. And I have to say, the only correction that his wife later made was that, you know, there was an account that said nude and underwear. She said, make it underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Secreted in the pitch black of the smaller of the two uh, forecastles he selected when the ship was open to visitors, Billy retold, he had actually toured. It was open, and that's where he had his stowaway spot. He retold himself there had to be a job on the ship for a determined kid like him with water clogged ears. Did he think of his mother so fiercely protective of her only child, a woman who would never thought him capable of betraying her this way. He had read the hoopla plan for the send-off in the morning, the brass bands and relatives and big wigs invited on deck to say goodbye before the New York loosened her moorings and the city's official welcoming tugboat brought well-wishers back to the shore. Rumor had it that Amelia Earhart, the new queen of the air, would loop to loop over the Hudson, the grand finale to send the ship on its way. Earhart was a great friend of Commander Bird, and unbeknownst to the public, the new mistress of his very married publisher. She had promoted the expedition as a personal favor, endorsing Muppy Strike cigarettes. Finally, and I'm just shipping a little bit away, just to get faster, but finally, snatches to sleep until something creaked. A rat? Scary shadows flickered across the walls. What happened next felt like a hallucination. Just a few feet away from him, on the dark second deck, Billy could see a kid around his age, equally shocked to have company. The puny boy whispered his name, Jack. Jack was a happy-go-lucky 16-year-old Jewish kid who had dropped out of school. Before this caper, Manhattan was the farthest he'd ever traveled from the Brownsville section of Brooklyn where he'd been born. Jack told his unexpected competitor that he arrived at the city of New York at 7 o'clock in the morning, an hour before. Well, determined Billy, then he was here first, hours ago. This was his spot. Jack tried to discourage Billy, insisting that it wouldn't pay for him to make the two-year trip without any of the thought he himself had put in. Why, Jack had brought a suitcase stuffed with warm clothes for once they reached Antarctica. He'd come aboard with extra clean underwear and a $100 bill pinned inside a coat pocket. Billy was practically naked, negative 74.4 degrees, he'd freeze. Billy was no dupe. Is that so? He shot back. If this was going to be such a rotten trip, why did Jack get off the boat? The boys argued for nearly an hour, cramped in their almost adjacent shelves in the lower hidden forecastle, first in whispers and then louder and louder. But then, to their joint amazement, yet another voice piped up. Keep quiet. They'll find all of us. <laughs> Could there really be a third stowaway? Yes, the voice told them for over two days. It was a deeper voice, manlier belonging to one Bob Lanier, a black youth of 20, even knowing where to look, Billy and Jack could only see his feet. <laughs> so that's part of the craziness of the story. And it almost sounds like a joke. You know, you're Polish, a Polish Catholic Jewish kid and a black kid who's still away on the boat. <laughs> but it caught the imagination of, it, it, it brought the story out of, the, of New York City to the United States, all, it was all over the papers. Um, it brought the story across the seas to England, to Poland. They were headed, um, uh, the, the, the expedition was headed, all right, here was the route. They were going down to Virginia. They were going through the Panama Canal. They were going over to Tahiti, where Billy had been an art student, and he knew there was, um, he had loved Gauguin, and he knew what was coming. <laughs> and he also, they also were going down to New Zealand, and where they were going to go to Antarctica. Um, but, as I said, he was, they were caught from all this yelling. They let Bob Lanyard go, of all people, the black stowaway. Um, part of the reason of that was um, because, uh, does everyone know Admiral Peary? 
he had been up to the North Pole and he had a, um, a black uh, assistant named Matthew Henson. And Bird wanted to have what he, he, in a very racist way, they wanted to have an assistant. And the Times even ran articles saying that they, they, they got him out of there with watermelon. I mean, it's really shocking to me in 2000. I mean, this is what it was like to me. So, you know, when you tell the story, you have to be very careful how you're, but you have to give the facts and also make sure that you're writing the same things. But there was a lot of resentment in the United States that a black kid got to go on this trip. And by the time he got to Panama, I, don't, I, will, I, will, I will say he did not make it to Antarctica, but he kept trying to get there. There's lots of great little subparts of the story. But Billy, who I came to really like during this writing. I know him for, I know this story really well. Um, he decided that once he was caught twice, he was caught on the supply ship, he was caught in the Gowanus Canal, he was caught um, on, in the Hudson River on the flagship, and nobody thought he would stow away again, including his parents. And by this time, they had moved on up to Bayside. They had left the Lower East Side. There was a, very, there was a large Polish community there. And his father um, had a upholstery business. Um, he was supposed to inherit the upholstery business, and he did not want to be an upholsterer. Okay. But about, and Bayside was where the silent film stars lived, and that's why his father had moved there because he felt that he could be the upholsterer to the stars. But this was not <laughs> the destiny that Billy wanted, and he decided to try one more time. And he jumped out of his window. I actually was knocked on the door. That house is still there. And a lady let me in and go. And I went to I saw the exact window he jumped out of, of the second floor. And he uh, hitchhiked his way down to Hampton Roads, Virginia, where the, the supply ship was making a coaling stop. And a reporter from the Virginia Pilot um, uh, heard that he had showed up. And Bird, had, Bird was not going on for the supply ship. He was going to leave from Los Angeles with the dogs. But he was there you know, for the publicity opportunities. He'd taken the train down. And the reporter ran into where Bird was having a meal and said, I can, you know, I can't believe the stowaway is here. And he said, what are you talking about? We caught him in Gowanus. That's not, you know, it was a big yacht club. It was not the smelly place that we think of today. This is where all the yachts were. And he was having lunch with all people with his brother. Now. Many people have heard of Admiral Byrd, but have you also heard of the Birds of Virginia? It was a very, very big political family, it still is. His brother was governor of Virginia. And his brother said to him, that stowaway kid is good publicity, and this trip is all about publicity. You're crazy if you don't take him. And that is how he was able to go. His father, meanwhile, they called the truant office. They, as Bird said yes, they arrested him. <laughs> his father was getting him arrested, and his mother said, you bring my son back. And now his father got talked to by Bird, and he had to face his wife back in Bayside. <laughs> but that was the start of this trip. And this is the scrapbook that I, going back to the wife and Cape Elizabeth, this is a complicated story, but it's not that complicated. I got the scrapbook, I got photos. As I said, he was an art student, he took drawings. Um, and then she lived with him for so many years. She was his second wife. His first, he had a very bad first marriage. This was the love of his life. Um, she kept everything in piles. I had telegrams from the South Pole, from, you know, from, from Antarctica. I had photos. I had stories. But she was only positive. I found out later also that he had had two children from the first wife and that they had gone in a different direction, that they had involved with drugs in the 1960s, they were arrested, they were down, and they died in jail, she thought. Um, she had no contact since they, they had spiraled into some drug abuse, both of them. Um, they lived out in, in um, they had moved out to Long Island, to um, uh, Northport, and there was a big scandal, the sons were in, the, and there was no contact, and I decided what can I do? I can't contact anyone from his family. But I had, this is my second amazing moment, I had William Garonsky in Google Alert. Does anyone know what Google, use a Google Alert? So if a guy put my name in the stowaway, if anyone writes about it, I get a little notice and I can go see what article it is. One day, 
after I signed the book deal, so I got the advance to go, uh, and um, before I you know, wrote the book, um, I got the advance to write this. One day, a Google alert goes off for William Goronsky. And this is lost history, and I'm thinking, who the hell has my story? I'm freaking out. And I go to Google, and I see an older man, um, he's in his late 80s maybe, and he looks just like William Goronsky that I've been writing about, who would be about 114. And I know what he looks like now, because I know his wife. And he said, there's a man in a prison in Florida uh, moving uh, prisons, he's, and he's up for bail. And I thought, wait a second, he's supposed to be dead. <laughs> and I absolutely didn't know what to do. I tried to contact Florida, said, can I reach him? He's in a maximum security prison. And they said, no, you can't talk to him. And I finally said, um, you know, this is American history. This is the first expedition to Antarctica. And this was the youngest man on the trip, and this is his son. He's the only one who can possibly know this much information. Because his wife knew him later on. This was his and I, luckily, I got a guy who was a Shackleton fan. <laughs> and he didn't know Bird, but he knew Shackleton. And I said, come on, help me, help me. And he got permission for me to go down to uh, Florida. Um, now, a, a theme here is my non-driving. <laughs> How do I get to this maximum security prison in the middle of Florida, the, in Orange Grove territory? We're not, I didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, I was trying to find the descendants of the other two stowaways. Remember the Jewish and the black stowaways? And, and so, um, as I said, I'm second to Jewish, and my mother used to work for Israel Bonds. And if you ever want to want some, find someone who's Jewish in America, you just have to see what year they contributed to Israel Bonds. <laughs> and I, I, my mom's dead, and they loved her. And I said, hi, this is Jean's daughter. Can you run a report on me, for the, on this name? His name was Jack Solowitz. And they said, he bought a bond in 1972 in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> it was like better than the FBI. <laughs> so I looked on Facebook, and there was a man in Tampa, Florida with the name Solowitz. And I called up, and it turned out that was his son. He had adopted children late in life. That's why he was younger. And I told him that I had found the other son in jail, and he said, I'll drive you. <laughs> and so that's how I found, I got my history on that. And the two sons of the men who had been caught because they were fighting 90 years ago, we met again in the prison, and they just laughed. They just laughed and laughed. They said, it's, not, it's hard to grow up knowing what, you know, what being a stowaway son. <laughs> and one thing that happened was that um, Jack was given a card by Berg saying, you know, you know, try to get some work with my company, but you're not going. Um, that was the Jewish stowaway. And Jack tried to stow away also on um, the Hindenburg sister ship, the Groff. So th these guys just did it for fun. I wrote an article recently for the New Yorker, not on this book, but about the stowaways of the 1920s. Now, if you think about stowing away, this is really important to understand. In the 19, right before that, the stowaways might be trying to get immigration status. They, you know, they might sneak into port. A lot of people have grandparents that came in from Philadelphia. They would swim in, um, or they would try to stow away. In the 1930s. Um, it was a different kind of stowaway. It was the hobo. They're riding the rails. They just want work. They want food. But this is the 1920s. And this was the equivalent of Instagram and social media and Facebook. They, these were kids. These were teenagers. And if they got their name in the papers, they and had in a fact, shot. there were some stowaways that were young women that would stow away and they would get movie deals by the time the one was going to LA. So that is the moment in time. What is interesting also is that why do we not know the story anymore? This is a great story. Why was this forgotten? Well, think about the time frame of this expedition. It's 1928 to 1930. They left. It's Jazz Age New York. It's Gerald's New York. Everything is roaring. The stock market is great. What happens in 1929? And so by the time they come back, it, it's not that they didn't get attention. There was a documentary that was made by Paramount that won the Oscar, but people don't care as much. They, they, they're, you know, they're looking for work. It's a different time. Um, there was a little bit of attention that they got, but that was really why this story was forgotten.
because of the depression, and it was at the end of the depression. What I will say is that um, how what happened to him? How did because that was in my other interest, and one of the things that was amazing to me is that he had to he thought I can't get a job. He asked Bird to get a job. Bird had to all these volunteers. He now had promised them jobs. Try to get 70 men jobs in the middle of the depression. And Billy decided I'll be an explorer. Oh, sure. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I've been asked to make an announcement, and that is, does anyone here own a tan Lincoln Continental? No. Okay. <laughs> the answer is no. Okay, thanks. Sure. And so uh, one of the things that he decided is that he he would have had a better shot at as came if he had actually been a trained, he wanted to be an explorer, not in the poultry business. So he, he said to Bird, will you help me get into Columbia University? Because that's where the, a lot of the scientists that had gone on this expedition and all the top men had been Ivy League. And here was a poor immigrant's kid from the Lower East Side. And Bird was relieved because he might not be able to do, uh, get jobs for everybody, but he could get a kid into, um, to a uh, college. So he was, of course, Bird was friends with everybody. He was friends with the president of Columbia. And I have actually gone to Columbia. I actually have an article about, um, Billy was completely unknown to Columbia University. And if anyone's gone to Columbia, there's going to be an article in the fall about how I use the Columbia research. But they um, basically ha had him come in at the end of the trip. And he was, had possibly the best um, recommendation ever on a college application. Summer job, Antarctic exploration, <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Bird. <laughs> and he got in, and it was a big to-do. He got into the top fraternity. I mean, but the, everything was going rosy for him. But meanwhile, his parents, who had this culture business, they were, they were hanging on in 1930. Actually, my, I have older parents, and my grandparents had a store and they lost their store, not in 1930, but they lost their store in the, after the Dust Bowl, which was in, the, in 1932, around then. Things got worse, and it, uh, it got worse before it got better, and his parents lost their store. And Billy was in the second year of Columbia University, and he realized that his parents had actually supported him um, even though he stowed away, even though he kept being on the paper, even though he'd been a truant, and he dropped out of Columbia University to help his parents, and he couldn't, they couldn't get any work, and he didn't know what to do. So what he decided was, well, I have some sea experience. He went down to the South Street Seaport area, which was really a seaport area then, not a tourist area, and he was able to get some menial work scrubbing the decks, uh, they recognized the stowaway. There was a couple of articles about that. And eventually he was able to get onto some passenger ships uh, on the other side by the Hudson River, including um, the S uh, SS United States, all those kind of uh, passenger ships. And he was such so trained. I mean, he had been a truant, but he had been trained at sea uh, on a huge expedition. He was fantastic. He was very polite to the passengers. Now this is a this is around 1935, uh, 36, and a lot of these boats were coming from Germany to New York, and many very wealthy Jews were starting to escape from Germany. And he was from the Lower East Side, and he he was not Jewish, but he was a Shabbos boy. Does anyone know what a Shabbos boy is? So that was his only job, that he would light the candles for the Jewish people, and he liked Jewish, he had Jewish girlfriends, he liked Jewish, and he learned Yiddish for stickball, he needed some Yiddish for stickball, and he spoke German, he was very good with languages, he spoke Yiddish, he spoke Polish, he spoke English, and he would talk in German, I don't, um, and some Yiddish, I think, to the members of, of that were escaping, the people that were escaping, and they couldn't believe that the Polish kids spoke Yiddish. And they started to talk to the officers on the boat, and they said, this kid is officer material. And slowly he became a third mate, second mate. They started to, people started to mentor him. And in fact, Captain William Goronsky was one of the youngest sea captains of World War II. And according to his wife, and I'm going to take questions after I tell you this, but according to his wife, 
He never talked about being a stowaway to Antarctica. <coughs> that was part of the reason that the story was lost as well. He thought, you don't do that. You know, that you don't want to, because Bird was a very powerful man up until he died in the 50s. There were about 20 books written in the 1930s. Everyone on this expedition got a book, right? But you had to write it to his specifications. You could never be bad. You know, there was nothing. And basically what happened is that um, he felt that the defining moments of his life were World War II because he was leading the Ramont's convoys. And those were the most dangerous convoys. He was the captain of the Merchant Marine. And there were so many men lost at sea. And actually, Jack Solowitz, the Jewish stowaway, he also was in the Merchant Marines. And so that was what he felt was the defining one. And the whole stowaway stuff was nonsense to him. It was great, it was wonderful, but that's not what we talk about. We talk about World War II. Didn't, he didn't even talk that much about World War II. And I. When I was talking, I was getting many more details from his son, who was in that jail cell. And he said to me that in the 1960s, he sold a lot of the relics for cash, for heroin. He sold, uh, the Congress gave a Medal of Honor. There was all sorts of you know, souvenirs that were still, you know, Bird was still uh, alive uh, up until the late 50s. People knew about the Antarctica expedition. And he had such shame. And now he's not been, he, you know, his arrest was over drugs, and it was over um, a, a stolen car, and it happened in Florida. Where you, you don't, if you want to steal a car, don't steal it in Florida. Because he's got a 35 year sentence, and they didn't overturn it. And um, he hasn't had drugs for 20 years, and he was actually very nice to me, and I had a great, he remembered very specific things, and his wife, which, who was in shock that he was alive, um, backed up. I checked with the Merchant Marine historians. He, they were telling me things like um, a Merchant Marine captain could shoot anyone on a, a boat during World War II. There were a lot of Germans being captured and brought back to America. And the Polish um, people were hated the Germans. And the Americans might want to try to kill the Germans. And if anyone touched one of their prisoners, you could kill. And that was some of the kind of stories that the, the stowaway's son was telling me. He also told me about um, a uh, crystal ball that his immigrant grandmother had and how she had been the only one to think that she kept saying to him, you're going to go to Antarctica. <laughs> and I have gone, I have seen, um, she, and he, she gave him a, a cross and he swam across the Hudson. And I've seen all these things now. And it's amazing to me. And I will tell you one last thing before I open it up to questions is that um, what's really fun right now is that someone has bought the film rights for this oh, a book, oh. and I really hope that um, it manifests. It started a script. I'm not going to direct it. This is not for me. This is a bigger story. But one thing that the, his son has told me is that he felt so ashamed of himself, and that the one thing he could do for his father was to help his legacy. And so you have, and I mean, he was a stern father. He was a sea captain. You can imagine. So you have the loving reports from the mother and the stern, tough love reports from the son, and you start to get a more full flesh person, a way a documentarian would hope to come up with a story that's not a cartoon, not a, a vanity project, but a full fledged. Because I was a little nervous because, according to his wife, his, um, Billy did nothing wrong ever. <laughs> so I, I wasn't bothered. But I would love to take questions that if you have. And, um, and then later on, if anyone wants to buy a book, I'm certainly happy to sign it. Anyone have a question? When did he die? Oh, he died in the early 70s, 76, I think. Um, so it's not early, mid 70s. And he had built in Cape Elizabeth. Um, he loved the sea. He didn't love upholstery. <laughs> and he built um, his house in Cape Elizabeth. And the kitchen was shaped like a galleon. And he he died. Um, his uh, his father had both had a weak heart, and he died that way. Um, and he's buried in Cape Elizabeth. And on his Grave, which I there's many pictures in this book too. This book comes with a 
a photo section of 40 photos. Um, but on his gravestone it says, um, the youngest member of America, you know, America's first expedition. And no one knew this. It was just his wife putting that on there. So now, hopefully, um, the story is going to be bigger. I will tell you one more thing. I forgot. There was another young man on this trip um, who, with the uh, bird as the master promotion, ran a similar contest to what had been run uh, during um, Shackleton and Scott's era of Boy Scouts. And they were going to take one Boy Scout along. And they ran a competition and 800,000 Boy Scouts applied. <laughs> and there was one man named Paul Seipel who was selected. He wasn't much of a kid, to be honest with you. He was 20 years old. He was six foot two, But he had the most um, Boy Scout badges of any kid in America. And he's 56, including taxidermy. And there was a big rivalry. Who was going to get to winter over? It went, you know, wintering over was a big deal because they were going to be the first to spend many months during. I mean, the, the coldest months are um, actually in summer because the seasons are reversed. And I will tell you, just so you know, I went to Antarctica for six weeks. I followed. I and that was the nice thing about getting a book deal is that they would allow me to go to New Zealand. And I didn't want to go from Argentina, where many tourists go from. I wanted to go the way the old explorers went. So I went from the bottom of, the, of New Zealand. And by the way, at the very bottom of New Zealand is a Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had terrible winds. And I saw, the, I saw the animals the same way that these men from New York City saw them. I saw the, the, the penguins come in a certain order. You see the Adeli penguins, which are really cute little. Then you see the giant empire penguins. You see, I saw a blue whale. We saw many whales. There were many more whales in their day. That's why they were whaling ships. They were blowing up whales with ammunition. Um, and that came to be one of his other great regrets, according to his wife, that he became a big champion of whales later on because he'd been involved with, you know, the, they, they just didn't take those lives seriously in the 1920s. Um, and what was really great about going to Antarctica because I hope I put some of that experience. I didn't write about myself in this book so much. Maybe like a, a par couple paragraphs about that. But because there's so much story, who needs me on top of it, right? But I will say that things you can accomplish by going to a place that you're writing about are amazing. For example, I would never think about the smell of Antarctica. I mean, what does it smell like? Ice, you know? I got there. And we were in some of the same spots that they would land where the penguins were. And it stank like a big cow barn smell <laughs> from the penguin guano. <laughs> and I just, I mean, choking. It was, I would, and then you see the dead penguins everywhere where they were, the ones that didn't survive. And then the other kind of details that I put in are things like light. I know when I wrote my first draft, because I went to Antarctica in 2015 for six weeks. And, um, I, I left my 16-year-old behind, and I said, I'm not going to be available to my husband. <laughs> it was the best thing I could ever do. Just six weeks off, from the and there's no uh, internet reception when you get to a certain point. Uh, it was so cold. I can't even express to you how cold it was. I, was. I had five layers of clothing. But it was so exciting. And one of the big places, I don't know if anyone here is an Antarctica buff, but where they were all going was the barrier which is the, not really the island, but it's this giant, miles long, mile high ice where they built a village called Little America. Um, and that was what, where I wanted to go. Um, there's nothing that remains of Little America because that ice has fallen into the sea, but I was able to go to Shackleton's hut, to Scott's hut, and see everything is kept in time. And it's just, it's so exhilarating. And when I got to the, the barrier, which is now called the Ross Ice Shelf, um, I was able to go on a, uh, um, a little inflated boat. And um, there was, I was on with an expedition of about 70 people, and most of them did not want to go uh, to the barrier. The weather was terrible that day. They have something called the catabatic winds. It's the windiest place on Earth. And it was terrifying. But there was a gentleman who was one of the guides who said, Laura, you've come this far. You have to reach the barrier. We had helicopters on our boat. Um, and I could, we couldn't land. And they said, the only way to go is um, 
by, by raft. And we went there, and at a certain point, he turned around, and now we have GPS, so now everybody knows where you are. And he said, at this point, Lori, you're the southernmost person on the water in the world. There are people on the North Pole station, but they're on their landlocked. You couldn't, the Ross Sea is right at the end of the earth. And that was such an exciting moment. And to be from the Lower East Side, I think, I don't know how many people have gone from Delancey Street to Antarctica, <laughs> but I might be the second. Um, and it was just so thrilling. And then what happened is when I came back, I looked at my draft and I realized all the things that I was missing by just writing without going there. And one of the reasons I wanted to go, and this is for the, um, make, I think some of the women in the room laugh, is because I was really afraid of, you know, there's people that are like moon experts. You can't get anything. I read an article once about the moon, and, you know, if you get one fraction of a second wrong, you get a note to the editor. And I thought, Antarctica, it's going to be the same thing. I've got to get everything right. And I got a letter from the old Antarctica Explorers Club. And they're most of the men, some of the men knew Bird, but there are, a lot of them are in their 70s, 80s. There's a couple in their 90s, and they said they were had a meeting and nobody could find an error in my book. And I find myself now an honorary member of the old Antarctic Explorers Club. So that was part of the reason I wanted to go too. And I, my husband did not talk to me for about two months because I spent half of my advance going to Antarctica. <laughs> but I felt that it was worth it. I kept saying, but maybe there'll be a film deal. <laughs> so now he's now he's excited. But. Are there any other questions? I don't know how I am on time, Penny. Oh, you're great. You're great. You're okay. absolutely great. Yes. If a film is made, who would you like to see play the main part? Oh, well, I think that's one of the interesting things. I had my first book, which I wrote, the one that Anthony Bourdain reviewed um, in 1997, was optioned for nine years. And every, I mean, never got made, but everybody, but the problem is that anyone that would be the right age, by the time a film gets made, I don't know if anyone has film connections here, it's either not going to get made or it could take eight years, nine years. So probably the kids that are like about 12 now. <laughs> but I, 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 was, I, I would love to see someone, I mean, Bird himself was a very good looking man. He was sort of a, an icon, I mean, an idol, American idol. Of, I mean, he was very good looking. He had a lot of um, uh, women wanting to go on the ship as well. They didn't let any women on there. But he was small. In a sort of an actor way, you know, like a Johnny Depp, as I was thinking. Maybe Harrison Johnny, Ford. Harrison, right. <laughs> but he was a small, good-looking man, and um, I, I think it's a great role for someone who is. He was 40 years old when he was there. He was not very old, I and mean, he was. He, you, I mean, I, you have to see the pictures of the sacks full of applicants for this trip, and I will tell you, in 1926. The most famous man in the United States was Richard Byrd, because he'd flown over the North Pole. No one even heard of Charles Lindbergh. And by 1927, he had, he had that flight, Charles Lindbergh became. But, but in 1928, they were still the two most uh, admired men in the country. And the, the main thing that was different about this trip was that, remember I told you that he worked with the head of the first a pioneer of, of um, public relations who was Sigmund Freud's nephew, but also a publicity person for Sigmund Freud. But he said to him, why don't you make sure this time you're not an idiot and film it or get some camera work? So they invited Paramount Pictures to send two people aboard. And they also had a New York Times reporter, Russell Olin, who won the Pulitzer Prize. He went down there. But there's film. And if you go on YouTube, if you're interested in this book or the story, just look up uh, with Bird at the South Pole. It's a 1930 film. It's completely off. The entire film, it's about an hour, is on, on YouTube. You can watch it. And Billy appears namelessly. Like, I know who he is. So he can get a credit, but I know who he is. And um, it's, that was their evidence. And again, they came back in the Depression. And the film did OK. did pretty well. But it was still not what everyone wanted to talk about. And the, the, the ticker tape parades just came to a screeching halt as well. And um, it did win, however, the first, um, the only Oscar to date for cinematography was won by the two guys that went on the trip, and they called them the, um, the Paramount twins. They weren't really twins, but these, the thing that's kind of amazing is that everyone knew every name on the expedition, like a baseball team. 
like, you know, and I, when I started this project and I found this by, by luck, with a bit of help from research and looking for what I wanted, but I was terrified. Who am I, this middle-aged mom, to write about Antarctica expeditions? <laughs> and I'm there, I'm, what am I doing? And I have come to know every name on the trip. I know what their personalities were. One place um, that exists is in Ohio. Um, in Columbus, Ohio, of all places, is where bird, the bird archives are. And he thought he would be famous for eternity. And it's like the size of a football field. There were four expeditions to Antarctica um, that over the course of years. And it's you go it, the the idea that America's um, Antarctica uh, research is in Columbus, Ohio, is a little odd. But I went there and I saw a lot of things. One final anecdote, which I think is really fun to leave you with, is that he didn't know why he wasn't invited back for the second expedition. He had his own radio broadcast, the stowaway report. He did everything that Bird asked him to do. He, got, he helped with his swimming. He was a great swimmer. He helped save. There was one Jewish man on the expedition who was also from the Lower East Side. He was the mechanic, and he fell into the water, and Billy dove in the water and helped get him, and he got a lot of recognition for that. Why wasn't he asked to go back on the second expedition, which was in the early 30s? And nobody, his wife didn't know, he died, we didn't know. I went to Columbus, Ohio, and I'm going through the files, and no one has ever pulled the stowaway file. You know, that's not the story that they, you know, that survived. I pulled it, and there's a letter between, and his mother um, had been writing, like my, my mother might have written, <laughs> um, to Bird. There was the craziest exchange in Antarctica history it's between this immigrant mom and Admiral Bird, and she's terrified about her son, Finally, she said, please, please don't take him, don't tell Billy, yeah. but don't take him on the second expedition. And Admiral Bird said, okay, Mrs. Goronsky, I promise you, even if he stows away, he's not going to go. And I got a copy of a letter, and I showed it to his wife, and he just said, if he knew, he'd kill his mother. <laughs> <laughs> so the middling mom <laughs> was the reason behind that. <laughs> Any last questions? How yes. old was his second wife? Well, his second wife um, is, was 20 years um, younger than him. Um, she had survived World War II. His first wife was a, a very, remember Hot Lips from MASH? She was like, a, she was like that. She was in World War II. She was a, a, jet, a captain, nurse. Like, there were a lot of captain nurses in World War II. And he met her, and everyone thought she was bad news. But she was hot, and so he married her. He, he knew he made a mistake right away because she was making fun of his Polish heritage and calling him a dumb Polak and you know, all this stuff. And so he always hated that. But he, then just as he's about to divorce her, she says, I'm pregnant. And that's the son, that, the oldest son that's lived. The other son is dead. And, um, but he didn't get divorced back then. And he just stayed. And then eventually it got really bad. Um, and he actually divorced her. Um, there was a he had bought like a lot of veterans came out to Long Island, and he bought a lot of the old Great Gatsby like estates were broken up during the Depression, and he bought 11 acres, um, at very cheaply. And he in part of the divorce settlement, he gave 10 acres to his wife, and they were living. You know, he lived into one acre, and he went to sea as a captain, and he went to Poland. And it was in the merch, you know. Immersion Marines, in it, but also he was going, bringing delivery uh, grains to Poland. And he landed in Poland, and he was a terrible, terrible divorce. And this very beautiful woman was there in Gdansk, and she was an antique lover. And he had learned so much on his expedition. He was with some of the most famous men in the 1920s. He loved, he, I've seen his books. He reads Keats, he reads Yates, he reads classical music, he had collected antiques. Everything was learned from being at this expedition. And she was a, working at an antique dealer. It turned out she was sleeping and she had no money because they had lost a lot of their homes in Poland. She had half of an arm uh, taken off from shrapnel as a young child. And people had told her she would never uh, get married. She's very beautiful. And he fell in love with her and he wanted to bring her back. But she loved Polish food. And she, even when I went up to visit her up in Cape Elizabeth, she made me a huge Polish meal. So 
So that was the right person for her, and she was an artist, and she had not had the career, it was cut short, short by World War II, so he decided not to have any more children with her, that by, so that she could do the, her art career. And so she has, she's actually uh, um, shows, you know, she's in her 80s, late 80s, but she shows all over, um, she's about 90 now, she, she shows all over me. And it so it really was a loving relationship. But the, the son tells it, you know, the wife was pretty nasty. I've seen some letters, uh, but you know, she was also his mother. And um, it's, it's not as it's not as black and white as that story is. And he was a tough dad. And I, um, he when he got very addicted, he just cut off all contact. He gave him some money. He had there was a grandchild, the, the heroin, and the other son. This was William, Billy Jr. and George, and they both had two kids. So there's grandchildren that have no communication. I will say that I got to several letters when this came out, including his um, first mate, who's still alive, who said he was the best captain and he had poetry all over. Everybody had to memorize poetry that he learned. Um, he was a lovely person. And I also, um, I also, uh, people, when you write a book, you wish that you can interview them, but they, it's too late by the time the book comes out. And one of his um, uh, cousins contacted me, and the family had cut off, like you know, some feud. You know, we we all know from family feuds. <laughs> they cut off 50 years ago. She was in shock, and this was her cousin. So she gave me a lot more stories. I will. The there is a paperback version that's coming out next year, and some I've slipped in a few more things. And the book is also going to be in several countries. Um, and there's a, a large print edition as well uh, that's a different publisher for, for people who have difficulty reading. And then there's French and Polish. and So he's going to be well known in Poland as well. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited to bring this story back to you and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Lori. It was a great hour with you. I hope you will all read the book, and um, we want you to keep working, keep writing, and come out and visit us again, because you are a great guest as well. Thanks for everything, and thank you.